Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the From Busy to Rich podcast. This podcast exists to inspire advisors like you to increase your profitability and the quality of your life, but not just for yourself, for those that you serve. And I am 100% confident that today's episode will help you fulfill that. Again, not just for yourself, but also for those you serve. With that, I want to welcome Wes Young. Wes, how are you today, my friend? Hey, Andy, doing great. Sunny day in Texas, it looks like, or just well-lit room? It is a combination of both. Combination of both. Well done, my friend. Well done. Justin, how are you? Doing well, sir. Excited about today. Awesome. Awesome. And um, I'm going to let Wes introduce our uh, guest for today. Uh, I'm just so grateful um, in, in happenstance um, and um, in, in crossing paths with uh, just really, really, really interesting, fascinating people who are then open to spending time with us. And he is one of those. So, Wes, I'll hand it to you. No, fantastic, Andy. So um, wh- where we'll go today, uh, I'll, I'll give a, a brief just recap of where we've come from. And I'm really excited about um, Matt being a part of our, our show today. And, and I'm going to let him talk a lot about just where he finds himself today, the things he finds himself doing and his story day in and day out. And, and then I'd love to uh, for him to, to back into uh, where he's come from, because I, I think there is so much richness in what he's doing today that has led up to that because of where he's come from. And, uh, and I think what we'll have for our advisors listening today is just something that ends up being so applicable to the, to, to, to the profit building quality of life that you generate in the lives of other people. As we talk through the story they're in about wealth and the story they're in about money. Uh, so really looking forward to the discussion. Um, this, this really tees right in with where we've been coming from in our series here. This is our series called 90,000. And uh, if you remember, if you, if the 90,000 comes out of this, if you live to be about age 72, you are going to spend about 600,000 hours, uh, give or take on the planet. And there's all kinds of funny things that this, this breaks down into. Like you spend most of your life sleeping. I don't know if you, you guys know that, but most of your life ends up sleeping and you have all these other tranches of things. But one of the areas we actually spend a third of our waking lives on average is in our work that we do. And, and the thing about that, the question we've been asking is if you're going to spend a third of your waking hours doing something like work, how's your 90,000 going? Because most of the time, if we were to ask anybody, it's, it, it, you're kind of going to get the bell curve of answers that we normally get. We're on the right side of the bell curve. You get people to say, Hey, I'm really satisfied. Uh, work actually feels like an exciting adventure I get to pursue. Uh, it's something I get to do, not have to do. Then there's the other side of the bell curve. And the other side is like, it is a penalty box between weekends. And, and it is like, the, it is kind of like prison. They let me out at night. They let me out in the weekends, but, but it's kind of like a prison or, or it's a, it, it's a never any state of problems I have to solve. Not, not, not an exciting adventure I get to pursue. And then most people, you know, and here's, I think one of the tragedies of, of what life becomes, if we're not careful, they're in the middle. They're kind of in that lukewarm spot of, Hey, you know, I'm doing this to survive and provide. Sometimes there's moments of satisfaction. Sometimes, sometimes it's the penalty box, but, but, but I'd say most of the time, it's just kind of somewhere in the middle. And, and what we've been saying is we're going to spend 90,000 hours of our lives doing something. Doesn't it make sense to really get the most out of those hours that if we could live more on that right side of that life, that work, our work is an exciting adventure we get to pursue, not an endless set of problems we have to solve. Wouldn't you want to do it? And and so I think w- with, with, with Matt uh, Thompson being, being our guest on the show today, we are going to dig into some insights just based on his journey and actually what he does day in and day out uh, for his work uh, and, and, and as he engages in the community that I think are going to be enormously helpful for us staying on the right side of that equation. So Matt, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. And, and uh, I, I know that, that everybody's going to get to know this really, really quickly when you start to speak. But um, you you are from West Texas, basically, right? Because that's your accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredibly sunny and incredibly beautiful West Texas today. I'm looking out my window here and the sun is just blazing down my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Matt, where are you? Uh, I'm from Belfast in, uh, in a little weird and wonderful country called Northern Ireland, which is uh, a separate country to the island of Ireland, which gets very complicated. But yeah, there's about 2 million of us up here. And there's about 8 million total uh, on the island. So yeah, it's a strange and exciting place to be. 
Love it. Well, we're so glad you're here. Um, Justin, real quick, um, you're responsible for Matt being here. So if anyone wants to get credit for a great episode, we're going to give it to Justin. I um, blame. <laughs> <laughs> no. I appreciate it because because he was a he's definitely um you know a, a treasure and it's interesting as you use that word because he, that's yeah. kind of what he does is he's a, a treasure hunter in a, in a certain form or fashion uh just meeting him happen to be at a conference together immediately recognized that there's something different about about this this guy and his ability to communicate and to to listen and hear and 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 tell a story and then and then help you in telling a story it was just really engaging and so when he talked about more specifically what he does and how he communicates uh and and i'd love to give a little bit of his background here in a second but it was just a no-brainer that that had to have him on if he was willing to be on and and fortunately you know i was able to put him in a chokehold long enough that he agreed uh, <laughs> what's funny is um uh, with you i'm actually thinking I, I wonder if he actually did put him in a chokehold it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> he confiscated my my irish passport would let me leave america so right. i said yes like, this is how we do it in america dude <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's a taxpayer funded uh you know uh hold there <laughs> so um so so matt let me just ask you directly um what what do you feel like you're great at what do you feel like in your story of your work you feel like you know for the experiences you've had in your life then I'll throw it to West to explore some of those. But what do you feel like you, is the, the greatest value you can add to your fellow man and woman uh, based upon what you've been through in life and where you're at now? Yeah, so I had a a particularly rocky road from the ages of 11 to 18, as a lot of us do. Uh, mine included, there was a, a breakdown in our family home and uh, a long period of ill health for me. So I basically was 11 years old. I was in a situation where I didn't get out of bed for like six months. And uh, all of the apparatus that comes along with that of mental health issues and addiction to many digital things. I don't need to, uh, I let your imagination explore into what those things could be, video games, etc. And uh, I basically found myself in a situation where I had so much bottled up inside of me. I found that I wasn't able to express or put words to what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. And I love the idea that depression, one way you can look at it is it's the lack of expression or it's depressing something down. It's pushing something down deep inside of you. And so I had all this kind of pent up desire to explore and travel and communicate and express myself. And what I do now at the core is my mission is to help other people express themselves. My mission is to take the things from deep inside other people and bring them out in a way that helps them communicate to the people around them something about them. And also, more importantly, to reflect back to them who they really are. Because it's often in the storytelling process and it's often in the talking process and and sharing your story that actually you're sitting there and you're like, oh my word, the light bulb's going off in my head. Like, this is who I am, or this is why I think this way. And so the bread and butter for me is it's storytelling in the form of podcasting and more specifically and more recently working with families to to tell their stories. So what I'm great at is drawing the treasure out in other people, uh, setting the stage for other people, or maybe a better way to say that would be setting the table for other people to to really be comfortable to be who they are and to express themselves in a way that is authentic and genuine uh, to themselves. Yeah, really quick, I want to jump in there. Matt is also clearly extremely humble. When we say he's like a good storyteller, it's not like you got a friend that tells good stories. No, he's he's done over 500 successful podcasts on his podcast and interviews. He's got 250,000 paid words as a writer, 100 plus speaking engagements. And he has a PhD in creative writing. So like, he's not a little good. Like he's, he's really good. He's just <laughs> being really humble in what he's saying. So yeah. Wes, Wes, I want to ask you how to connect some of these things and these skills with advisors. I, I, I love it when, you know, you go to a conference and you're like, they bring in this person. What do they have to do with us? And then you make the connection yeah. and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel yeah. like I just got a life hack. I got a back door into to, to being a better advisor. Yeah, and to set that up, Matt, if you if you would, would you would you talk to us a little bit about what like a week, a month in the life of you is like these days, the things that you're doing and the things that you've built and have done? Uh, cuz I think that'll begin to give some unique insight into, 
you know, how you're employing these gifts that you have and the skills that you've built to really draw the treasure out of other people. Yeah. So I'm going to take you to 18 years old. So I, to pick up the story, I suppose I, I had a, a radical uh, spiritual experience that changed my life forever. It set me on a path that uh, has totally transformed my life and I believe my family tree. And I uh, was restored, restored fully back to full health and experienced this unbelievable amount of like confidence. It was like almost all of the the years that I had lost. If you imagine like a bow and arrow, okay, like being pulled back and back and back and back and back. It was like there was so much tension so much energy and so much excitement that whenever finally at 18, that bowstring was let go, I just felt like I was kind of like flung head first into the big bad world. And so I left Northern Ireland as soon as I could. I finished my last exam. Next day, I hopped on a plane and I wanted to make a dent in the universe. I wanted to change people's lives. I was bright eyed and bushy tailed, as they say. And so I ended up in uh, Rwanda in East Africa and I worked there for uh a few months making documentaries and doing manual labor and all this kind of amazing stuff that's kind of shaped me into who I am today. And the stories that we were hearing there of forgiveness and moving on and overcoming trauma after the genocide and things like that were just um, unbelievable. And from there, I kind of bounced around. I was in Nepal, I was in Haiti, in that nonprofit space, in that uh, social sector. And then I ended up in New York City. And so I was working with drug addicts and homelessness uh, up in East Harlem bit of gang, gang member work, which uh, there's a few interesting stories in there. But we ended up doing this really weird niche thing. And I promise this, this will make sense in a second. We set up New York City's like first hoarding ha- task force team. So I don't know if you've ever seen on the TV, like those chronic hoarding TV programs where yeah, everyone yeah. Will- knows. Everyone is okay, familiar. good. So, okay, yeah. thank you for interpreting the audience. Uh, absolutely. So, everyone, and I don't know think, if everyone would admit it, but yes, everyone has seen those. Yes, right. So, stacked up, you know, you can't move, you've got these little kind of like things you have to shuffle down, like in between rooms, things like that. And we worked with people exactly like that, only it was New wow. York City. So, instead of having you know the eight bedrooms and things like that, they had like a studio apartment. And so, the people would give us a call and they would say, Look, can you help these these guys? They're going to get evicted in 30 days unless unless they can change. And so here's me, like, you know, 19 years old, no experience, no qualifications, nothing. All I had was curiosity, a desire to make a difference, and and this ability to to draw the stories out of people. And something really, really interesting happened. And this this is something that stuck with me throughout the rest of my career. If we went in and we tried to kind of forcibly remove things from people's apartment, game over. It would never, ever work. If we went in, and so we would have 30 days, and the strategy that I ended up developing was, we're going to spend the first two weeks, and we're not going to throw one thing out. Wow. So we're going to spend two weeks showing up every single day, you know, six to eight hours a day, and we're just not going to do anything but talk. And guys, the craziest thing would happen. It's like the longer we spent in that incubation stage of building up trust, of hearing their story and getting to the core of why somebody holds on to things. The actual home renovation project before and after photo, it happened in a matter of days. I'll give you an example just to kind of put bone, uh, put flesh on this so there's a woman that we worked with she worked in a in a high rise or she lived in a high rise in chinatown and i mean like you know overlooking the brooklyn bridge the manhattan bridge is like this is the you know if it had been anywhere else we would have like fifty thousand dollars a month and we walk in and it's it's what you would expect uh to be from uh, a hoarder's apartment and her you know her life story was that she was born in china the year that Japan invaded. And so she was brought up in abject poverty. She would move from place to place. She would tell stories of like her mom feeding her and her siblings like salt for dinner. So that's the level that we're talking about. And finally, she moved to America and she pursued the American dream and she made all this money and got married and started a business and all this great stuff. And it actually was 9 11 that she watched happen from her apartment window that just reset her back to that traumatic moment and from that point on she held on to everything because the army were running up the stairs and flushing her toilet with you know gallons of water that they would carry and you know there was all this the electric would go out sporadically and it just took her back to back to that moment 
And when we understood that, we were like, okay, we now have full empathy and full understanding for why this woman is this way. There's no judgment. You know, you remove all kind of mystery around it. We've given her a chance to tell her story. And then we very clearly, with the trust that we've established, we say, okay, so now that we know each other, we trust each other. Let's talk about what you want. Do you want to do you want to keep living here? Yeah, of course I do, Matt. Like I love this place. Okay, great. Let's work together to make sure that that can happen. And like I said, you know, it, then the day the day we would start to actually do work, it's like we would get rid of like 50 massive black bin liners worth of stuff. And so that I think is an interesting concept or metaphor that we can apply to your world. Where it's like, okay, it can be very easy to get in there and be like, right, let's just get the contract signed and let's get this set up and that set up and like da-da-da. But actually, very often, it's like the longer you can sit with someone, the deeper you can go with someone, the more you can fully understand their pain, the more you can fully understand what they want, what they desire, you'll be able to actually create a way more elegant, bespoke, powerful solution that will help them achieve the goals that they want to achieve but it might take a little bit longer for you to get there. And so the 90,000 hour concept I love, instead of just chasing you know, 90,000 clients to hit whatever your personal revenue goal is, it's like, what if you run an experiment where it's like, we're going to take longer, we're going to go slower, we're going to tr- focus on serving people, we're going to focus on adding value where we can. And lo and behold, the way the mysterious universe works, you end up making more money along the way. You know, it's, it's crazy. Wes? Yeah, that... That's awesome. I, you know, I think about that and, and just the, the things that you, you said there that you're, you, 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 we have a concept we always call be honest and honoring in the way you communicate. And, and what I love about that is it's, it's, it stresses, uh, basically tries to put into words what you just said beautifully, which is you, you spent time up front trying to just understand the story that they were in as it relates to the current condition they find themselves. And, and and really getting to the why behind what it was that they were they were doing, and because it wasn't a story that they even really enjoyed staying in when you ultimately got to it, but it, but it was understand that hey, it seems like this is the way you got here, and and instead of coming in and saying, look, you know this is bad, we're going to start throwing stuff away, which is a complete you know that's that may be honest, that may be where you want to go, but that's not honoring because that's not that they're unable to to move from where they're starting to that place until you got to really tap into, Hey, help, help me exp- understand the the journey you've been on to lead yourself to where you currently are today. And and then, and then I think kind of pivoting on that, what you'd said also is things so, so useful is, Hey, you know, do you, do you want to still be here? And, and do you want right. to be like this or, or different and, and allowing them to go, you know, I think I want to be here different. And, yeah. and you're going, well, there's a path for, I'm not, get, we get why you're here. And in light of that, you want to be here, but you want to be here different. Let's talk about the ways we can go ahead and accomplish that and, and begin moving that. And instead of it being a, a, a like it, it, it becomes to them the adventure, right? That they get to begin to pursue with you instead of something you're doing to them. It's something you're doing with them. And, uh, and I, I just love that, man. I think it's so applicable because. All the, all the advisors listening, while you're, you're not doing that exact narrative or conversation with the people every day, here's what's happening is they're, they're all in a story about money and about life and about work and about family. And when you meet them, uh, at least the kind of clients most of the people on the, on the podcast want to work with, they're doing all right without you. Like they're, 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 you know, they're, they're making money. They've got assets. They probably got advisors that are doing some things in their life. And so at best, you represent maybe a positive interruption to their normal. And they can fill up their day with things they already have to do already without talking to you. And so when you do that, the one of the most powerful things you can do, I think, is exactly what Matt just just de- what you just demonstrated, is that um you 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 first tap into, hey, let me, I want to get to know your story, where where you're coming from. And then in light of that, if if you want to continue to increase profitability and quality of life, here's things that people that are in the exact same condition as you that do want that, the things that they we can talk about that may be interesting to you that have done it. Instead of coming in with, hey, I've got great ideas, here they are. Well, exactly. You, you don't know. You don't know. And, and the important thing in that is that you make them the hero. Absolutely. So you don't come in and you don't try to be the hero. Because the only way people will actually go on the hero's journey, that transformative journey, 
as if they are the protagonist, if they're the main character. You know, like, I don't know if you guys like Lord of the Rings, but like Gandalf didn't show up to the Shire, knock on Frodo's door and be like, here, give me that ring. I'm going to go sort this, you short punk. Do you know what I mean? Or it's not like, follow me and I'll do everything for you. It's like Gandalf, for all the characters, it's a beautiful story if you know it well. Gandalf is a hero making machine. And that's why everyone loves him and respects him because he takes people exactly where they are, whether they're a hobbit starting off in the Shire or they are this amazing warrior called Aragorn who's going to become a king. And Gandalf is the guide. He's not the hero. He's the guide. And that's what we do for our customers. That's what we do for our families. That's what we do for the people in our lives who we serve. We're not the hero. We are the guide. And we hold them by the hand and we show them, give them tools, we show them paths, we give them ideas of how they can go off on that heroic journey, whether it's to, you know, not get evicted from their apartment in Chinatown or to build generational wealth for their family by using some sort of fancy, clever US awesome things that I don't even have a clue that you guys do, but I've all respect. <laughs> That's the way we talk about them. They're US awesome things that are. <laughs> yeah. There's some people run, yeah. Anyway, so Matt, Matt will you, will, will you take a little bit of time and and just and just keep going with like wh- where? So that's where you kind of begin to polish this thing and evolve and and really get a head around. Hey, I like this. I can see application for it in so many different ways. Talk to us a little bit about what what it's like right now. Like what you what you're doing. Uh, yeah. They, so there was absolutely nothing strategic about it. You know, I was just following the thing that I knew I was put on the planet to do. And it's, you know, like everyone listen to this, your your passion and your gift can wear multiple different outfits, you know? And you, you're you doing the same thing basically throughout your whole life. You just have something unique to hang your hat on at every step of the journey. So I hated Northern Ireland. That's one of the reasons why I left. And so I, I met a, a wonderful ICU nurse called Jackie when I was out there in Manhattan. I was there for three years. And one thing led to the other. And we were like, okay, time to... Time to put a ring on this time to get married. And so we were totally broke. Like we had no money whatsoever. We both had been working in a nonprofit. You didn't need, (laughs) you just needed to talk to her. And she was like, (laughs) I'm in. Like, how am I going to compete with that, Matt? You know, like in like video game characters, like different people with different strengths. It's like God just gave Irish guys good accents. It's like, they they, they bumped us up in that area. I I walk in in a bar in New York and and I sound pretty cool because I'm like from Texas. So they're like, (laughs) okay, that's good. But then you come in, talk to the same girl. I'm out. I got no shot. Right. And I was like, I'll just go get your drinks, guys. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, sorry. Keep keep going. Keep going. Oh, good. So uh, we were looking for someone really cheap to get married. And um, my, my wife was, we were sitting on the sofa one day. She was scrolling through Groupon. Do you ever remember that website? Groupon? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Right. So she was scrolling through Groupon. And somehow, instead of it being in New York, because we would go on Groupon date nights, so it was kind of our thing. It was, for some reason, it was set to Ireland. And she was like, dude, here's a wedding package on Groupon like in Ireland. And I looked at it, I was like, is that really how much it is? Like, oh my word. So I, I, th- I was like, you know, and it was for like a winter date, you know, the worst dates ever. And so I just shot the email off and I was like, hey guys, you know, like, could we get married like in the summer? We'll we'll pick any day. Like we'll get married on a Monday. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. So that was how we ended up moving back to Ireland was just, we got a really cheap wedding deal. And the crazy story is on the way home on the flight, right? Uh, Delta Airlines had overbooked the 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 flight by like 40 people. And so they start doing that auction thing where it's yeah. like, uh, does anyone want to take a volunteer for $500? And I, w- I immediately was like, go be a good, I'll pay for like half the wedding. And she's like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. And I was like 600, 700, 800. And then it was like 1,500 each. And I was like, babe, I'll do anything. We'll get the fancy seat covers that you want for the wedding. We'll get the extra flowers. Like, <laughs> and so, boom. So we we often say like Delta Airlines actually fully paid for our wedding. It was the exact price of the Groupon. So we end up back in, in Ireland. I'm like, let's stay here for three months and get out of this hell hole. You know, I can't be here for too long. I had no skills, no qualifications, you know, on paper. So I was doing cash and hand work. I was like working as a gardener. I was working as a bicycle messenger. And dude, it was cycling around Belfast like doing deliveries in parts that I never would have been before that I like totally fell in love with the place. And Northern Ireland has a bad rap, as I'm sure you know, of bombs and bullets and they built the Titanic and it sunk. Like this place can do nothing right, you know? And <laughs> so we, uh, I just started seeing this and I, I've been on the subway in New York and people hear the accent and the first question, uh, the, the first thing they ask is, oh, are you from Ireland? I'm like, yeah. And the first thing they usually say is, wow, your English is so good. 
to that, I usually reply, <laughs> thank you so much. That's amazing. And I just lean into it. And then they say, where are you from, Belfast? I'm like, oh, are you guys still blowing each other up, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. And so even though, I hated, even though I hated Northern Ireland, I was like, I dare you talk about my country like that. We are <laughs> so much better than that. And so I kind of had that like, stewing in the background. And I realized that my hatred for Northern Ireland was rooted in, you know, really, I had myself to blame for the problems in my life. And I thought it was Northern Ireland's fault. And then you leave Northern Ireland, your problems are still there. You realize they follow you. Oh, maybe I'm the problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I say, look, how are we going to change this negative nor- narrative of Northern Ireland? I'm meeting all these amazing people that I'm uh, in conversation, you know, old ladies in bus stops, baristas in restaurants, chefs working behind the counters of the restaurants I'm delivering for. And I was like, let's start a podcast. So really simple, started a podcast called Best of Belfast. It was all about celebrating Northern Ireland and the incredible people in it. And seven years later, we have not missed a Monday. We've published 350 episodes. We've reached a really, really passionate audience and have launched a podcast production business off the back of it that's going really well, where we produce podcasts for companies all around the world, including fancy American companies. Can you believe it? Nice. And uh, then, then there's the, the Family Legacy product, which we'll talk about later in the show. And so what we're doing now is, what does my week look like? It's storytelling as many hours as I possibly can. You talk about the 90,000 hours, something that's really important to me, and I know Justin as well, because we met at a strategic coach event, is spending as many hours in, in my unique ability as possible and trying to get rid of all, all the excess, you know? So like the admin, the the carnage, the emails, it's like, how can I strip as much of that away so I can spend as much time as possible doing the thing that I'm on this earth to do, which is sitting down in front of somebody and and drawing out their story in a way that's powerful. And so my 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 week to week is just story, 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 story. We've had the chance to interview some of the most incredible people on the planet, people I've looked up to my whole life, heroes of mine. You know, there's an author called Seth Godin who we had on the show a few oh, weeks ago. Uh, we interviewed like the former global CEO of Coca-Cola, who just so happened to be from Northern Ireland, like 15 minutes down the road where I grew up. We got to interview like the nephew of JFK and just like crazy things that like you never, ever would have expected. And you're sitting there talking to, you know, uh, a member of the Kennedy family about how the assassination personally affected them and their and, and their family and the impact of that. And you're like, what happened? Like, how did we get here? But uh, the answer is it's it's seven years of, of going in one direction and following that passion. And uh, it's been amazing to see where we've ended up. And Groupon and Delta Airlines, right? Hey, and like uh, we have we have Delta Airlines to thank. So there you go. <laughs> That's right. That that is awesome, um, man. Th- and thanks for for sharing that. And and I, I just want to say for for you, everybody that is in the space that all these advisors that are listening to this, um, we're in a business that that I don't believe prepares people very well to discover the stories people are in. And if you want to get a just PhD in this um, of someone that does it really well, you go listen to episodes of Matt's podcast because it is it is amazing the questions you ask because there's there's I think there's there's certainly questions that uh, you know people have to ask to conduct any kind of conversation, but there's two things I notice about you whenever I see you uh, conducting these conversations where you're really drawing out the treasure in the other people you're 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 drawing out the story um but as you do a couple things really really uniquely well in that 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 i think is a part of your passion but probably also just iterations and 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 practice is is you're you're able to one you you really seem like you want to know the answer to the question that you're asking so you're, you're you're super genuine in the way that comes across and i think sometimes that's just communicated through the air um where where you want to be there and you're not doing it so you can get to the next thing you want to say to them you're doing it can, because- I, just, can I just really quickly give like a 10 second thing to that yeah please please dive in so there's a, a quote about writing that I really love an old mentor told me it and it says no tears in the writer no tears in the reader and with with conversations and storytelling and podcasting we've adopted that and we basically say no curiosity in the question asker no curiosity in the listener and so the listen or the, the host of any conversation, whether it's recorded or not, is the avatar for the listener. They are the conduit. They are the energy source that everything gets funneled through. And so if someone doesn't want to know the answer to the question, you feel it in the air, exactly what you said. Now, that that is such a big deal. And I think for, for those listening today that you're not there yet and, and you you want to get there, 
because here's the deal. We, I mean, you will spend your, we do our business having meetings. That's what you do. Um, and in those meetings, you can have somebody that walks away from it going, wow, that was just a really different experience, incredible experience. And, and the capacity to not only draw the story out, but, but sometimes put that story in a context, because I think the other thing you do really well, Matt, that, that is just phenomenal is not only do you want to know the answer to the question, but the questions you continue to ask and then, and then in the layers of the onion of a person that you pull back. By the time you're done, like when you get to the, to like the end of this thing, that person is, they see their life in it through a different lens. And it's not because they didn't live it. It's because nobody ever put it in language for them. Nobody ever wrapped it in context to say, Hey, okay, it sounds like here's where you were and here's where you, where you are now. And what, what then, and along the way you had these milestones that made you what you're doing and, and, and which is. They are, they are so excited about it. And they lived with themselves that whole time. And you're able to like reinvigorate them around. Yeah, here's what you've done. Yeah, they've read the story before, but they're still, they're still enthralled by it. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, so I, I think if, if like, uh, and I mean this, when you, you want to get really good at asking questions that are meaningful, valuable, relevant, that actually help people make better decisions, live a few regrets in their life, it, 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 you study Matt's podcast and study the way he asks questions and and even the way you set your your podcast up is completely different uh, from what you think. You start in the story, which is what I love. You know, you're like you're like back and forth, and we're like, who are we even meeting with? Yeah, I don't know. And, <laughs> yeah. and it's like then you find out who we're meeting with, which is so cool and so powerful. Right. And I just love it, Matt. Um, if I'm wrong, you can just say it wrong because I'm wrong all the time. But is the reason you jump into the story right away because people? always want to listen to the rest of the story. So there's, there's like 10 reasons why we do that. And right. tell me, tell me why mean, you the, start with us the, in the middle of a story or with a story. Versus, so the first, the first reason is it's just personal preference. You know, uh, very often I'll listen to podcasts and I'll be like, Hey Siri, skip five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that way you can ask the advertisements the oh yeah Dude, no, I, 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 I just want to get into the value i'm like yeah. get me in to the heart of the story as soon as possible mm -hmm. and if you look at how uh you know any movie starts in storytelling there's this lovely phrase called a lovely concept called the opening and balance mm -hmm. and the opening and balance is you open the first page of a book or you watch the first 30 seconds of a movie and you're kind of like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. And as storytellers, we often want to hold the hand of our of our readers, or our audience, maybe a little bit too much, and not be comfortable with the ambiguity. And so people will figure it out. If the story is interesting enough, people will want to continue to listen more. The other reason why we do it, and this is just this is just straight up, is because uh I hate doing the intro. I hate figuring <laughs> out what to say. I, I I just like I, I like to have something that feels very as if the listener is in the room with us. And so pretty much exactly the way it happened in the moment is exactly what the listener's getting. And I think you feel that to the show. And you know, we we don't do it for our business shows. It doesn't make sense. Like we are a, a B a B B to C, you know, long form storytelling sure. oriented podcast about Northern Ireland. We don't apply that to to even the shows <laughs> that we produce for other people. But it's also, I just, I like to, to, to get into somewhere interesting very, very quickly and let the story unfold from there. And I also, I personally believe like every single person has an unbelievable story to tell. And so I don't feel the need to pump up my guests and like oversell them and, and like play like a status game with the listener. It's like, if you listen to this podcast, the people who've listened to every single episode who I meet on the street, regularly they say you know it's always the the conversations or the person that i never thought i would be interested in that i end up loving the most yeah and so i like to almost like re remove the ability to choose <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'd just be like guys trust me it's gonna be good and i'm gonna do my best it. to make it good. i love you it I mean? you're saying your episode titles are another episode Another episode. <laughs> yeah, Justin pretty much. Lee. I shouldn't. I shouldn't even give the name. I should That's like black saying, out the person's you know? face. <laughs> You'll like this one. This is good too. Right. Yeah. Um, Justin, I, love, I was just gonna say, I love how applicable it is for our world. It's just the jumping into the story because when you when you first meet with a client, there's perceptions or like preconceived notions on both sides. 
there's the the on the normal advisor side, like looking to get information because it's typically a transactional world. And then and there's the client side that's expecting that and then like has all these like like parsed out answers, like ready to go. Right. Like here's my assets, here's this. So yeah. jumping into like the story side first just completely changes the dynamic. And I love the like for us, we we agree with Carl Richard has a great quote and We've paraphrased it and that's what we use. We believe that real financial planning is the constant realignment of capital. So time, money, energy, talent to the things that matter most. So wow. it's interesting when you flip it on its head and you start focusing with the front end of the story, where are you? And I love that you use Lord of the Rings. If you look at Bilbo Baggins, right? Like he was fine. Like he was good living in the Shire and the movie smoking his pipe, right? Like 100%. Lots of food on the anything. table. In his mind, he didn't need to change the course of direction because the direction is where he wanted to go, at least what he thought. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, here comes uh, Gandalf, right? And just completely throws out something new. No, and through that storyline and walking through that story, no, where you actually want to go isn't isn't this. Sure. Right? Like helping him him do that. So I, I think that's something for advisors, those of you listening, of like the key here is is all of us have heard to like listen to understand. But it's really digging deeper and, and and trying to drive around that story to find out what is the ultimate objective because it's not the same for everyone and it's so uniquely different. Um, yeah. And it's it's just conversations that people aren't having. People sure. then want you to be want to be a part of the story that you're helping them to write because it's so different and so unique. Um, yeah. And I, to be honest, you know, I know you guys said we're going to go for four hours today, so I'd like to spend at least two hours of that talking about Lord of the Rings for the rest of the time. If yeah, that's okay. yeah, for sure. <laughs> but like, so Lord of the Rings is kind of the perfect story and storytelling structure. It does follow a very, very clear hero's journey narrative, um, which anyone who's, who's done any sort of looking into stories or Hollywood, how they structure movies, the hero's journey is really interesting. So, you know, you're talking about uh justin you know bilbo being in the shire that's called the normal world where it's just like they're living their life they're not thinking about anything and then there is like the knock at the door from gandalf that's like the inciting incident that's the thing that starts everything what immediately follows that is is the call to adventure so gandalf will be like bilbo you have the chance to do x y and z are you prepared to save the world with by doing this important quest and usually what happens, every single story is called the refusal of the call. Yeah. Where Bilbo yeah, shuts the heart now. Yeah. Nope, I'm good. I don't want to go anywhere near that. Like, I don't want dragons. I don't want this. Or in your case, no, I like the way my investments are. No, no my, the way my assets are. Like, I've got like a couple of million cash in the bank. Like, I'm sure that's fine. I'll just leave it there. And so the 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 refusal, the slamming of the door in the face is actually part of the story. So that, that that's kind of interesting. And then the other thing is, you know, Wes, you were talking about you guys are in the meeting business. Like your calendar is just a series of meetings. Your calendar is a series of podcast interviews. Every single appointment is a little mini self-contained story. And Justin, what you were talking about, about starting the meeting off differently, you can create an open and imbalance with your meeting. And the best coaches and the best leaders that I that I work with, they do this naturally where you'll hop on a call, like even a sales call, and they'll be like, Oh, Andy, great to see you. What like what are you most grateful for today? And it's like, what? You know what I mean? They'll completely throw you off. They'll start in a totally new place. Yeah. And that first question that you ask somebody, you know, a, a question that I, I I really, really love when sitting down with somebody is like, oh, by the way, we ask someone before we hit record, we say, Hey dude, like, what are you grateful for today? As the sound check question. The microphones work fine. They have always worked fine. It's a sound check <laughs> question because we actually just want people to answer that because it puts their brain in a different state of mind. These people are maybe, they've got a script, they've got something to promote. We want to unbalance them because we want to get something different and authentic from them. And, you know, one of the other thing, questions we ask is, and, you know, we just ask someone, like, what's the first thing you can remember? And immediately you see them break eye contact with you and they go like this. They go, and they look up and they start searching through the archive to find things they haven't thought about for years. And boom, there's your opening and balance. You've shifted their brain away from the script, as you were saying, Justin, and into a totally new arena. And all of a sudden, the conversation dynamics are totally different. They're, they're way more open. They're thinking about things that they didn't plan on thinking about. And that can create a very, very powerful atmosphere to wherever you decide to lead them next. Wes? 
No, I love that. I love, I love the, especially the gratitude question of, of like, Hey, what, what are you most grateful for today? Because I, I think, um, we, we, we often talk a lot about the equation of, uh, contentment that it's not an absence of ambition. Um, and in fact, I believe w- without a bigger vision for tomorrow than your current today, I don't think contentment's possible because I think God wired us for this desire to want to make things better, to make today sure. better than yesterday, tomorrow better than today. Um, I also think it's for, especially depending on how you're wired, I think it's really easy to get so focused on where we're going that we don't enjoy where we are on our way to where we're going. And I, so I think right. it's that equation of gratitude and and, and adventure, that gratitude and and vision, that that ambition that makes that contentment possible. And I sure. think with what your question, which is so beautiful and, and I'm going to use that uh, absolutely <laughs> in all my meetings this week, I'm just going to begin it in there. Hey, we're, we're just curious what are you most grateful for today? Partic- you yeah. know what I love about that too, is we've got clients that have been, um, you know, we're, we're a couple decades in the business and, and, you know, we all have stuff we need to get to. We all have things we need to talk about and that we want to, that we want to execute upon, but what a great way to just to create some contentment in the adventure, because when we usually what we're doing, we're coming into the meeting and we're, and we're, we're going somewhere. We kind of know that, but to stop and just, Hey, what are you, what are you grateful for today? Because that part of the equation is if there's anything left out, especially in business meetings and conversations, it is that kind of, what's your grateful condition right now? Like what, right. what, what are you, what are things you have in your life that you once prayed for? Right, that that exists right now, and I, so I love that question. Sure, I mean another another one that I love is there. Let's say you're you're sitting down with a customer tomorrow. Uh, you guys probably call them clients sitting down with a plan tomorrow, and uh, they've just got back from a ski trip. You know, you sit down and you just hit them. You know, very calmly, very casually, you sit down and you go really, really slowly with it. Because I think a mistake most people make is they try to go too fast. And I think like good conversations, like a good bottle of red wine, right, Wes, yeah. where you, yeah. you you open it up and you have to let it breathe, you yeah. know, and there has to be space. There has to be a little bit of a pause and just really casually, you know, as you, uh, before the formalities, just kind of like, oh, Wes, like you were on a ski trip. You know, what's what's one thing you'll definitely not forget about that trip? And again, you'll see it in the person's face. It's almost like a form of shell shock where they're like, oh, no, I'm like not in the headspace where I was before, you know. Well, and I love that because that, what does that do? It's, you're asking them to, Hey, tell me a part of the story that's going to live with you forever yeah. about this adventure that you've been on. Cause you're a collection of your experiences and memories and, um, and drawing out those things that are like living there and, and internal, it's just such a, such a beautiful way to do that. Um, I I'd like to, I got, I got a question, uh, for you on this as you, as you're looking forward into your future right now and the things that that you see that are possible out there, the places you, you the things you want to build and grow into. Um, what are some of the things you're most excited about right now on, on, on your journey? That was a Matt level question, Wes. Good job. He looked up when I asked it. So there you go. You got me. (laughs) That's how you know, dude. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I'm really excited to keep playing the game. I so, will. you know, uh, I come from like a very creative, arty, farty sort of background. So a lot of my stuff are, is very much aligned with that. And, you know, I, I really love, I heard something re- a few years ago and it was like the success for an artist is just the ability to keep on going. And so whether your art is you know, playing baseball or jazz music or telling people's stories. Like success for me is just to continue down the path that allows me to keep on doing this. And that requires business smarts and acumen and building a team and SOPs and processes and systems and all this sort of great stuff. But it's the ability to keep dedicating as much of my calendar as as possible to uh, do the thing that I love and the thing that I think is my highest form of contribution to the world. So, you know, it's been interesting. Kind of like I, I guess one of the the big challenges over the last seven years, seven years since I was a, a bicycle messenger, seven years since I got married. Seven's very important. Here we go. And uh, it's just been like, how do you monetize this thing? You know. So it's like, I I love talking to people. It's like, how the heck do you make 
a living talking to people. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm excited at exploring all the new ways and avenues that you can do that. And there's a million ways to do it. Podcasting just happens to be the medium that I've found and that I've, I've totally fallen in love with. So I'm excited to push forward the boundaries of podcasting. I'm excited to um, redefine kind of what what the industry can look like and, and what even interviewing can look like and different thought leadership and frameworks around question asking and getting people to open up that has been really fun to talk about today of how it can be applied to different industries and things like that. And I, you know, I'm interested in, in talking to the most interesting people that I can possibly find. And the further I go down the, the path and the deeper I go into the journey, the more interesting the people become. And part of that is freedom of relationship, as coach would say, where we get access to really interesting people. But more importantly, it's actually personal growth and development of myself where my level of curiosity is increasing and therefore I'm becoming more interested by anyone that I meet and finding new ways to draw more of themselves out in a more powerful way. So yeah, I'm excited about that. So, so Matt, that uh, one, I love the answer because it reminds me of so many, uh, it reminds me of so many things I love. One is, is uh, Simon Sinek's work around the infinite game um, because mm. you're, you're, why are you, why are you doing it? I just love to play this game. I just love to get, not to, to win or lose. It's because I want to continue to keep playing the game. That's the goal of the game. And right. when I think about it, there's, there's also a, a guy, um, uh, who, who was the marketing director for Chick-fil-A. Um, and you know, which is multi, you guys don't have Chick-fil-A's I'm guessing over there. We but don't, but anytime we come to the States. Okay. Oh. Yeah, my wife. I was when I met Justin in LA a few weeks ago. I sent my wife uh, a deadly picture of the waffle fries, and she just sent back the crying <laughs> emoji. She's like, "Have another one for me." That's how I knew that she really loves me. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is the the uh, God's holy food. I think is really what. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the marketing directors from Chick Fil A once, uh, 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 Richard Salyers, I think was his name, and he talks a lot about. Um, when he first got his job at Chick Fil A, when back this is back in the day when the marketing department was out of the back of a trailer that they added to a trailer, so it was like way back in the day. And he said, you know, I came out of school and I had one goal, my, or, and my goal basically was um, centered around this thinking: retire as quickly as I can. So to do that, I got to make as much money as I can as quickly as I can. And so all of his friends they they get out of school and they're looking for these jobs, and and then he met Truett Cathy, who was the founder of Chick Fil A, and 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 Truett said, hey. What if you could create a life that you don't want to retire from? Would that change your approach to life? And, and what I love about what you said, and you can see it in you because it just it communicates through the air when you talk about it, is you've created a life you don't want to retire from. You, you, if you're uh. not doing this to get to a thing. You're doing it because you love the thing. You love the battle. You love the fight. And yeah. I love that about, about, about just your whole thinking and setup. And honestly, think about that as it relates to like the, our audience today, Matt, is, is um, that, that goes back to our 90,000. Are they, are, is this something they show up to work every day because it's something that they have to do? It's another endless set of problems they've got to solve. Or have they created it in such a way that it's an exciting adventure they get to pursue right. that they don't want to retire from? They're in a story they love and they're going to continue to try and express that story and make that story better and grow it. And it, it's going to be different. But, but, but how, so one of the best answers I've ever heard to the question. So you're <laughs> we said like a, a big, stuff out of there. <laughs> we said like a big hairy audacious goal, as they say, and it's okay if it's totally unrealistic, but we just, you know, the 10,000 hour principle, you know, if you yeah. want to master something and we just said like, dude, in my lifetime, I want to do 10,000 interviews. And when you frame it like that, it's like, I have only done about 615 so it's like, I'm not even 10% of the way there. And that excites me. That's, uh, well, it'd be easy if you live uh, to like 150, like Dan Sullivan. We got to work on that side to it if we want to <laughs> hit the goal. <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah, it's not that hard if you live to 412. I, mean, it's way easy. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Well, it's like Moses had so many interviews because some of them, I mean, it's 412. Dude, hundred percent. Imagine what the podcasts are going to be like in the afterlife. So these things are going to go forever. forever. <laughs> we, have wow. we got we time. Seven billion. We got time. Yeah, <laughs> we got time. Yeah, we got time. We got time. Uh, Matt, I want to mention one thing and then throw it to Justin for uh, for us to wrap up. Um, 
I want I want advisors to make sure that they're, they're you're making the connection between some of the things that Matt does in the show and some of the things we talked about today, and just the practicality of no one who has a healthy mental or physical state or any level of self esteem or values their time at all wants to be around someone who isn't curious, like I or who is the expert. And takes no interest in themselves and like in other people. And so there there is this draw, and I would just call it a lie, that you have to sort of exert your knowledge or intelligence. It is it is only to do that as much as you can help the other person. Um, I am not drawn to people who are not curious about me, meaning I don't want to be around you unless you care about me, and vice versa. And I just hope that the advisors who, if, you know, for you listening today, that you'll carry this into your next interaction, which is that people love to be around people who are curious about them. Mm. And that is very, very actionable. Whether it's your kids, how was practice today? How was ballet today? How was school today? How was whatever? Or your spouse or your clients. Right. And so I, I hope you'll carry that forward with Matt's example and then do listen to his show and hear how he asks questions, because, you know, Wes is very, very passionate about teaching a different kind of advisor uh, to be a different kind of advisor. And you have to sound different. You have to. Uh, and frankly, most of you don't. And we want to help you make that change. Uh, Justin, I'm going to throw it to you and then Wes, you can wrap it up. Yeah, I, I think it just makes it such a different process and feeling. Instead of just jumping into the next client meeting, right? You're jumping into the next story. What are you grateful mm-hmm. for today? Right? Like that's such a more exciting thing to jump into when you wake up in the morning. You're not just looking at a bunch of advising client meetings like that could potentially create some, you know, actual revenue return. But you're going to jump into a bunch of different stories and be a part of that and have a, a, a real impact. Um, on really the legacy that they're creating. And so, Matt, really want to, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the thing that you were telling me about when you talk about creating legacy or, or on the topic of creating legacy. I thought it was so neat. Um, when you're telling me a story about taking like a World War II veteran and, and you guys like created like a documentary and like a, a book and this thing to be able to give and create this legacy that could be handed down and like the memories and all the everything wouldn't be lost in carrying that forward. I thought that was such a neat thing and ties into what we do because ultimately people are creating retirement legacies and estate planning and all that stuff, right? Like, but, but, you know, having something like that, a physical thing, I just really loved it and how it, it could be applicable in so many different ways and how it's so impo- impactful it could be. Having received something like that myself was amazing. I just want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So like everything in our lives, it, it emerged really naturally. Uh, along the journey of podcasting. So, you know, we've interviewed 500 plus people for various podcasts and uh, just due to time and probability, a few of those people have passed away. And when that happened the first few times, it kind of freaked me out because we would have a massive outpouring of like emails and texts from family members and friends and colleagues who are just like, thank you so much. And this would be an interview maybe we maybe did like three or four years ago where it's like, you know, this is the only place this person's voice was recorded. It's the only place their story was recorded. Uh, we listened to this at the wake. We listened to this at the funeral. We listened to this once a quarter as a family. Thank you so much for telling my dad's story. And I always knew podcasts were evergreen. You know, there is a, a really, a very, very long shelf life to content like this. And then it was only after um, my father-in-law actually in Germany was was basically saying, hey, you know, I don't really know what you do, but I know it's something to do with microphones and podcasts. It's like, would you sit down with uh, with the grandfather of the family, you know, the patriarch, and just kind of share his story? So we flew over for Christmas to Germany one year, and I brought the, you know, all the gear. And, uh, you know, on Christmas Day, we all sat around, and the microphone was there, and we just let him talk. And the things that came out, a lot of the things no one had ever heard before. And, you know, this man was a, a prisoner of war in the Nazi camps in World War II. This guy was then a prisoner of war in the American camps. 
and talks about the difference between the two and he talks about drinking coca-cola for the first time and playing cards and smoking cigars and smoking american cigarettes and flirting with like service staff and all this sort of mad stuff and you're like you're kind of like scandalized you're like granda like (laughs) i I didn't know you were like that and he went you know and so we just got all this color and all this all this flavor and it was amazing and that was kind of like the early seed of the idea and we did it for a few other family members then and then it was only really until um really a couple of years ago where where we had a death in the family i had a grandmother that passed away and you know you're doing the thing you always do you're at the funeral and you're sitting there and someone's giving a eulogy and again you're like my granny did what (laughs) all this stuff starts coming out we're like oh little meek mild barbara it's like (laughs) you were wild like this is awesome and again you know even just like stories from her childhood where it's like you know uh you know she used to her family at nighttime would hear the air raid sirens during the war and they would all run outside the whole cul-de-sac, the whole neighborhood would run out and sit on this little hill and they would already have a picnic prepared for when it happened. So they'd have like midnight picnics in the middle of the dark and they would look out over the town and wait for the the bombs to drop. And you're like, this is gangster. Or, you know, like <laughs> she, she was brought up like during the time of rations and like every single year for Christmas, she would ask Santa Claus for bacon because she loves bacon. And it's like, and again, ever since like I was a little boy, my granny always would give me bacon. You're like, you start connecting the dots, what we talked about context and the story and everything. And so um, people started asking us, they're like, Matt, we love your approach to story town. We love what you and the team do. Would you sit down with my dad? Would you sit down, um, you know, with my granddad? Would you sit down with my uncle? I've just sold a company uh, I'd like to document my family's history. Uh, you know, there's someone in the family who's sick. Would you would you take some time and spend a few days with them, et cetera, et cetera? And so it all organically really grew up to the point. There's a million different ideas slamming into each other in in the brain. And we just realized it's like, dude, like we've we've been spending all these years telling all these stories that we haven't been telling the most important stories in the world to the most important audience, and that is your family. And mm. um, there's so many of us. If I ask you, where are your Christmas photos from 2014 on your iPhone 7? <laughs> yeah. If I give you a floppy disk, if I give you a VHS, it's like all these things, we think that our own stories are secure and safe and it, it couldn't be further from the truth. And so we realized it's like, you know, everyone wants to write a memoir or, you know, they like the idea of a memoir, but no one wants to do, you know, 100 plus hours of work. And we just realized it's like, dude, let's create this product. And so we put our heads together. We invested the money. We did a few uh, experiments. And now we have this this really beautiful family legacy product that we're really, really proud of, where we parachute into someone's living room with a film crew. We spend a day with them drawing out their life story, using all those types of questions that we, we've talked about today. Uh, we get to the core of who they are, their their insights, their wisdoms, their lessons, their highs, their lows. And we go there with them and we create uh, their story for them. We put it in this lovely kind of presentation box. We create a hardback book with a paper copy. We uh, get photos from the day. We get a time capsule with all the assets. We have a digital thing in the cloud. And the idea is like you can literally put this box into the hands of future generations. So it's the, it's the you know it's a family heirloom that you're not just passing down a photograph that's two dimensional, but you're passing down, you know, like a 3D four hour long video of someone's life. You're passing down um, not just some sort of random abstract story told through a, a granny who heard it from her mom. It's like, no, no, you're hearing it from the source of this is what it was like. This is the hardship that I've endured. These are the lessons that you can learn from my life. These are the hard earned wisdom that I want to pass down throughout my family tree. And it's been one off, if not the most rewarding part of of my storytelling career so far, and we're so so excited to see uh, where it all goes from here. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Now that's awesome, Matt. That's a, that's a, that's a great way to kind of kind of put a bow on things here today, as, as it relates to um, just the the miracle of what a story can do and, mm. and the transformation it allows to take place in the lives of the uh, not not just the hearers but the teller. Uh, to, right. to recap that and the value and the love and the joy that that brings in the world uh, that's easily lost forever if it's not captured. So, man, thanks for the work you do. Uh, and, th- and thanks for being a, a part of the podcast today. We're going to 
definitely try and uh, coax you to come back uh, for <laughs> sure. And uh, no, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Loved it, guys. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And uh, folks, if you want to learn more about the project that Matt referenced, just check our show notes for a link for that. Uh, also, do check out his show uh, and give yourself some time to enjoy it because uh, you will enjoy it. Justin, thank you for uh, the connection with Matt. Um, and um, everyone, thank you for listening. And uh, go live a better story. Uh, we appreciate you listening to ours. Thanks. Thanks.